Welcome to the online breakout session, NMOSD and COVID-19 update. I'm Lisa McDaniel, Director of Advocacy for the Guthrie Jackson Charitable Foundation. The Guthrie Jackson Charitable Foundation is proud to be a source of information about NMOSD. We hope everyone is well and coping with the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. With information changing on a daily basis, we are reaching out to the NMOSD community to aid in your navigation of the many questions at hand. While the foundation does not provide clinical care policies or recommendation, we hope today's breakout session will assist all the NMOSD patients to make informed decisions with their doctors. Joining us today is Dr. Michael Yeaman, Chief Medical Advisor to the Guthrie Jackson Charitable Foundation. Dr. Yeaman. Hello, Lisa, and hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be. We really appreciate your time as always, and it's great to be with you. Um, of course, uh, COVID-19 still big in the news, and we really wanted to take time today to focus with you on vaccines and how they relate to NMOSD. And then we'll talk a little bit about the variants as well. So why don't we jump right into it, and that way we can get to some questions and answers. So one thing, just to make sure we're all on the same page, Everything we'll talk about today is available in the public domain. Um, I'm going to sort of refer to guidance from a number of different agencies in the US, in the United Kingdom, in other places in Europe and the World Health Organization. What we'll talk about today is based on sort of the latest information, but you know what we say today might change tomorrow. So um, we, uh, we're all kind of learning on the fly here and doing our best to keep up. Uh, one thing we know is that there are no FDA approved vaccines for COVID-19. There are vaccines that have gotten emergency use authorization. We know that uh, protective immunity, the actual mechanisms that protect us against COVID-19 disease still being worked on and are not perfectly clear yet. And importantly, vaccines are not one size fits all. And there's some important uh, distinctions that we'll consider as we go through this discussion. Okay, the topics for today are really gonna be all about COVID-19 vaccines and NMO. And we'll first start with uh, how the vaccines work because I think it's important to understand the basic mechanisms of these vaccines. And that will help all of us sort of uh, then look at how they might work in NMOSD. Um, we'll also, um, discuss how some of the vaccines may be affected by different immune suppressive therapies. And then we'll talk about uh, the variants and how the vaccines may work against them. And then wrap it up with a quick uh, look into the future to the degree possible, okay? So let's jump right into the, um, the basic mechanisms of the COVID-19 vaccines. How do they work? And here is a quick summary that I think will be useful to all of us so that we're all kind of thinking the same way here. So the first step in how these vaccines work has to do with the antigen. And as you all know, antigens are typically proteins that the immune system sees and responds to um, in ways that defend the body against um, bad things happening to it. So there are two major kinds of vaccines that we'll talk about today. The first are the messenger RNA vaccines, so RNA ribonucleic acid, so it's one of the genetic vaccines, mRNA. The other major type that we'll talk today about are the viral vaccines, and the one that we'll focus on are the adenovirus vaccines, and those um, include the, the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine and the, the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine that you probably heard a little bit about today. Um, and there's many others that, that are represented by these uh, versions that we won't talk about today, but we wanna focus on these two, at least in understanding how they work. So very quickly, the mRNA vaccines deliver mRNA um, that is slightly engineered from the virus that causes COVID-19 um, disease. And it's put into a nanoparticle that particle fuses to host cells so that now this cell is becoming a vaccinated cell. The mRNA is, is a blueprint that allows protein to be made directly from it. And what protein is made from the mRNA uh, vaccine mRNA is the spike protein from the um, COVID-19 virus. And that uh, spike protein then 
um, moves through the cell and ultimately appears on the surface of a vaccinated cell, including in places where you all know are important for T cells and B cells to see the part of the protein. Um, the viral vaccines work in a very um, similar end game. That is, the ultimate result is the same, but they, they function in a different mechanism. So the, the viruses, these are DNA viruses. So their job as a virus is to infect a cell and enter the cell. They sort of disassemble within the cell so that the DNA can be pushed into the nucleus of the cell where it then is um, changed uh, in a different form through something called transcription into RNA and mRNA. And then that gets turned into protein. So both of these uh, platforms of vaccines have the same goal, and that is to create spike proteins from the virus that causes COVID-19 and have those proteins expressed on the surface of the vaccinated cell. So that's how the antigen, the spike protein, um, is delivered, uh, one through mRNA, the other through a virus. Now, uh, we'll talk about the virus uh, delivery in, in just a few minutes, but um, importantly, the viruses that are used are, are intended to be harmless to humans. So we'll come back to that in just a second. The second step is what the T and B cells do when they see these protein antigens, the spike protein that are encoded by the vaccines. And you've heard us talk about this kind of uh, science before, but there are cells that are called antigen presenting cells and they detect these spike proteins either on the surface of a cell that's been vaccinated uh, or just as debris that they pick up, they will load pieces of the protein into complexes that then through this molecular handshake that we talk about are um, displayed for uh, uh, T cells to see. And you can see here that um, this is a CD4 positive T cell having its molecular handshake with an antigen presenting cell, which is presenting to it a little tiny piece of this spike protein. Now the T cell, once it is uh, um, activated and given sort of second signals, it then becomes an active T cell that recognizes that antigen and it will begin to talk to B cells and it will begin to look at cells that are, uh, that are either immunized by the vaccine or infected naturally, which are expressing these spike proteins on their surface. So a couple of things are happening here. First, T cells can uh, approve B cells to make antibody, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And also cells that are vaccinated or infected make these proteins that are called interferons. And interferons are important because they notify other cells that there might be a virus coming and they can protect themselves by the interferons activating a series of mechanisms within those cells. So there's a lot of stuff going on here in terms of what the responses to the, the antigen are, but they are mediated by T cells and B cells. Next step are the effectors. What are the things that actually defend us against the virus? We know that T cells and B cells kind of um, recognize and govern responses, but what are the actual um, tools that the immune system uses to defend against the virus and its infection? So the first, of course, that you've all heard about are antibodies. Antibodies bind to the surface of the virus. So here's an antibody binding to the spike protein of the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. And when you, when you bind antibodies to the surface of a, of a pathogen, you neutralize it. That is, you prevent it from binding to the receptors that it would like to bind to. In addition to antibodies, there are important other cell-mediated and molecular-mediated responses. First, antigen-presenting cells can also activate what are called killer T cells. And killer T cells will seek cells that are infected by the virus, and they will kill these cells. And by doing so, they also kill the virus within those cells. Because remember, viruses require our host cells to replicate. So if you kill a cell that the virus is trying to use to make more viruses, you'll sort of kill that virus. 
Um, we also talked about interferons. So this infected cell is now giving off interferons that can help other aspects of immune system um, effectors like uh, antibody response and T cell activation, as well as the cells to protect them, themselves uh, against viral infection. So there's a lot going on here, but the effectors, the actual tools that the immune system uses. Now, the fourth step and the one that's really important is memory. Just like we have in our minds, the immune system has a memory. And uh, we like to think about how the first time the immune system sees something, which is called primary immunity, it activates a certain level of, of defense and protection. But when the immune system is exposed again, that will usually trigger a much longer term and what's called durable immune memory. So here is an example if we look at percent protection on a relative scale here, and we're talking mainly about the mRNA viruses here because we know the most about them, uh, the mRNA vaccines, uh, because we know the most about them. Um, you can see that uh, on the first dose, there's a pretty rapid immune response, but it, it will rise to a certain level, but then it will start to plateau. And this is called primary immunity. And it's possible that after just one dose with the mRNA vaccines, for example, the uh, response will start to wane, which is why at day 21 or 28, we give a second dose, and that triggers a much stronger and much higher degree of protection. And this is through immune memory, because you're making the immune system actually recall what it had seen earlier. And when that happens, you get a longer, more protective response. Now, just keep in mind, there is good response even on the first dose. So even with just the first dose after seven days, um, there's a very high degree of protection against death due to COVID-19 disease. And after the second dose, a week after the second doses, you can get up to 95% protection against the disease at all. So there's very good protection. Now, if we were to overlay the news this morning from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we get good protection. It's about 72% overall, a little bit higher for, um, for disease-free, uh, uh, death-free, and a little bit lower for disease-free. But overall, pretty good response. So uh, four steps, antigen, T and B cells, effector function, memory. Okay, now let's take all of this and focus it really carefully on vaccines against COVID-19 in NMOSD patients. And I've tried to just summarize this in one slide that I hope we can, we can uh, think uh, through together. So these are considerations, they're not recommendations, uh, but here are the vaccines, the, uh, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna NIH vaccine, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and the Novavax vaccine. And you can see they have different compositions and different uh, components. Um, the two mRNA vaccines seem like they're identical. They're actually not identical, but they work in a very similar way. Uh, importantly, the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine and the Janssen uh, j, j vaccine both use a virus to deliver the, the, the antigen ultimately. And because they uh, are viruses, we have to just have a few more precautions in mind, but we'll talk about those. And then across the top here are uh, patients uh, who are um, NMOSD patients um, in a number of different uh, sort of categories um, that we can think about and how they might be helped by vaccination against COVID-19 disease. So first of all, there is recommendation and guidance from the FDA and the, uh, the, the, the health service in the United Kingdom and other places in the world that um, the mRNA vaccines and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine are um, useful in individuals, uh, including those on immunosuppressive therapy. So in theory, they are usable in patients who have NMOSD who are being treated with immunosuppressive therapy. Um, there was a report uh, from the German health agency that we have to be a little bit more careful with the, the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in individuals over 65. Uh, but um, in the elderly, in adults, um, the mRNA vaccines look like they're, they're safe and effective. And for the most part, the same could be said for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines. And remember, this has changed a little bit 
um, since uh, the last couple of months when we first talked about this. In general, when you use a live attenuated virus vaccine, you have to be a little bit more careful in patients who are immunosuppressed. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, pregnancy, uh, the recommendations from both the FDA and CDC, as well as other agencies around the world is there are not enough data to be um, uh, giving uh, absolute recommendations or guidance. But in women who are pregnant who have a very high risk of bad outcomes with COVID-19 disease, then the guidance is suggesting to go ahead and vaccinate. The, the vaccines appear to be safe even in, in women who have been pregnant, who have been vaccinated, even though that has not been a formal part of the clinical trials. Uh, so use with caution. Um, and of course, any vaccine use is really um, important to talk with your NMOSD neurologist and your other healthcare providers to make sure uh, to discuss any special considerations and to optimize safety measures. As far as pediatric and adolescent patients, um, the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine was tested in patients um, as, as young as 16 years old. So that's the, the uh, availability there. The other vaccines uh, in theory could be used in these ind individuals but there's not any uh, formal data yet. So those data are pending and their use in adolescent or PED uh, patients remains um, a judgment best discussed with your neurologist and your healthcare provider. There are really no data yet on, on using these vaccines in infants. There will be studies um, uh, done in the near future. As far as NMOSD patients who have comorbidities, again, the, the mRNA vaccines, and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, very likely to be safe and, and induce protection. Um, we don't know much about uh, the, the Janssen, Johnson, Johnson vaccine yet. It's likely the same case that there should be uh, uh, usefulness in individuals who have NMO and a, another comorbid disease. So that is a, a quick snapshot of uh, the, the fact that there are vaccines that can be used in NMOSD patients. We have to be a little bit more careful with the vaccines that have uh, a viral delivery system, but for the most part, uh, good reason to feel like there's a good uh, option for every NMOSD patient. Now, let's think a little bit more about um, what is the potential impact of immunosuppressive therapy on vaccine response? And I've just tried to summarize here some of the key points. First of all, any immunosuppressive therapy, which is uh, abbreviated IST, can alter uh, response to vaccines. So that's just generally across the board. When you alter the immune system using a treatment that it suppresses or enhances the immune system, it will, could alter immune response to vaccines. However, the impact of different types of immunosuppressive therapy and different types of vaccine responses are likely to differ a little bit from person to person. So we can't say that there are any absolutes. Uh, it's really sort of a case by case uh, personalized approach, but there are some general themes and here's what those look like. If you're thinking about anti-C5 or anti-IL-6 receptor drugs, those are likely based on other studies from other vaccines, not the COVID-19 vaccines, but from other vaccines to only modestly affect vaccine response. So there's a good chance that if you're using an anti-C5 drug or an anti-IL-6 receptor drug, that uh, you'll have a good response to the vaccines. Steroids, azathioprine, methotrexate, and mycophenolate uh, might moderately reduce vaccine responses. We know particularly methotrexate can dampen uh, responses to vaccines, for example. Uh, we do know that anti-CD20 and anti-CD19 agents are likely to reduce the B cell mediated response to vaccines. But I'll come to, uh, to remind you in just a moment that the T cell responses um, uh, might be very important in vaccines. And so even in B cell uh, depletion, it's a good idea to strongly consider vaccination. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, it's important whenever possible that uh, immunizations are updated before um, anyone begins immunosuppressive therapy whenever possible. 
However, even on immunosuppressive therapy, there are good options for vaccinating against COVID-19 disease in NMOSD patients. So here are a couple of just visuals for you to consider with your doctor. Um, again, we're not making any recommendations, but just uh, some concepts for your consideration. If you're on an immunosuppressive drug that has frequent dosing, let's say every few weeks, um, you can, you can uh, kind of get a sense of, you know, when you, when you dose frequently, as shown by the red arrows here, the drug target, let's say, complement protein 5 or the IL-6 receptor sort of uh, goes down in response to each of the doses and stays at a level which is best for therapy in NMOSD. And as such, um, the question is, when can you vaccinate? Well, it's best, of course, to vaccinate before you start these drugs, but even on their uh, ongoing use, um, vaccination can be done recognizing that there's a theoretical potential for modestly diminished efficacy. I'll say this now and I'll probably say it again, uh, even a good degree of protection is better than no degree of protection against COVID-19 disease. So for drugs that are, are dosed frequently, um, uh, if you can't vaccinate before you start those drugs, then talk with your neurologist and you should be able to vaccinate even while uh, amidst ongoing therapy. If you're on a, a drug that is dosed infrequently, um, so these might be some of the, the B cell um, targeting agents, for example. Again, we wanna to try to vaccinate before the drug is initiated. Um, we know that some of these will, will you know, dramatically reduce B cell uh, uh, numbers and, and, and activities. And that's a good thing in terms of therapy for NMOSD. But as far as vaccines, we know that that can inhibit some of the vaccine responses. Doesn't mean you can't be vaccinated. It just means best to, to get vaccinated before you start these agents or talk with your neurologist about what's called a dosing pause, which is an opportunity as the B cells come back to vaccinate in this window of time here. So you get a good optimum between uh, B cell uh, management and vaccine response. Okay, so there are good options regardless of the kinds of drugs you are using. Lastly, before we get to the questions and answers, um, you know, there's a lot of, of buzz in the media right now about the variants and whether the vaccines will protect us against the variants. And I just wanted to go through very quickly um, some details and hopefully this level of detail will, will help you understand and maybe even share sort of the facts with others. So first, we know that these kinds of viruses uh, intentionally mutate. They go out of their way to mutate. It's called error-prone proofreading. So every time they replicate, they want to make mistakes because some of the mistakes will be you know, better than others. And so if you look back at you know, uh, early 2020, there were a few common um, uh, types of the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that were dominant. And each of these lines here shows um, sort of a, a different branch of the evolving type of variant that has been emerging. And I'll just take you very quickly right here uh, in about October of 2020 was the emergence of, of what has been called the, the UK virus. It's obviously not the UK virus, but it's just a mutant that happened to be found there first. Um, and it, uh, it's relatively uncommon um, in the United States, at least at this point, as of a couple of days ago, but there's concern that it, it can infect a little bit more. And because purely of a mathematical issue, so far as we know, the more people who are infected, the more chance for bad outcomes and possible death due to COVID-19. So you know, that's the reason that people are, are worried about it. Um, here's the, the uh, organism that's come out of South Africa. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So bottom line, this virus mutates intentionally. It's fully expected that there will be variants. And I'll sort of discuss now what this means in terms of the vaccines. First, I just want to remind you how the immune system sees or targets um, antigens uh, 
including how vaccinated individuals' immune systems will see these antigens. So on the left here is a, is a very highly magnified uh, model of the spike protein of the coronavirus shown. Here's the virus membrane or a cell membrane that has been infected. Here's the spike protein. And here are antibodies that bind to it. And remember, this part of the spike protein is what engages its receptor on our cells so that it can bind to our cells. That's how antibodies see this, this spike protein. They see it as a, as a complex three-dimensional structure. However, T cells see a much smaller and more precise piece of this protein. So they just see a little tiny piece of this protein and it's loaded into this, uh, this receptor that we call a T cell receptor um, and it's antigen presenting uh, cell receptor MHC complex. And when these two come together, as we discussed earlier, that activates the T cell to do all of its responses. The point I'm trying to make is if you have a mutation, it can alter a little bit how antibodies might bind um, less or more. It's much harder to create a mutation that uh, T cells do not recognize. And that's what I'll try to show in the next couple of slides. So here is just a model of what the antibodies see. So you can see the purple spots here on the spike protein are amino acid residues that are mutating in the, in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 virus and where they occur with respect to the receptor that the virus binds to. And this is just a little piece of the receptor, which is called the ACE2 receptor. So the spike protein wants to bind to the ACE2 receptor. That's how it gets into our cells. And there are mutations occurring exactly where you would expect on this facet of the spike protein that make it bind more or less to the receptor. And you can see the, the numbers that we hear about in the news, like the N501Y or the E484K. Those are just numbers of the amino acids in, this, uh, in the spots on the spike protein that can alter um, the ability of the virus to bind. What's important to recognize is that some mutations are better or worse than others. So I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but if you think about the likelihood for a mutation to cause antibody evasion or, or for the vaccines uh, that require antibody uh, to not work um, versus the likelihood that this mutation will occur, there's a lot of mutations that are occurring that uh, you know, occur at a pretty high rate, but they don't really affect the ability of the organism to bind or evade um, antibody. This one up here, for example, is one that we might be a little bit more concerned about. For example, it has a pretty reasonable um, rate of mutation. For example, about one in 500 replications, you'll get this mutation. And it can potentially have a high degree of evasion of antibody. So that's why some mutations are more concerning than others. This mutation, this E484K, is the mutant that people are concerned about in the virus uh, uh, that's emerged in South Africa. Here's the, the, the virus that's called the 501Y uh, protein uh, mutant that's associated with the United Kingdom. Again, it's not caused by the UK. It's, not, um, uh, it's nobody's fault there. Uh, just as none of the other mutants are anybody's fault. They're just, this is what the virus does. Uh, but you could see that uh, so far, at least in many parts of the world, these, uh, these uh, strains have a very low degree of prevalence, but that will rise as they become more um, dominant. And the question is, will the vaccines protect against these strains or variants um, as they emerge? And I think some good news is that if you look at these little tiny linear pieces of the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, that is the variants of the spike protein, in relation to the T cell epitopes, you could see that for the most part, there are no mutations that occur in the T cell epitopes. That is the part of the spike protein that the T cells recognize. And in particular, I just wanna point out, there are three immunodominant 
um, places in the spike protein that are really important to the T cells <clears throat> recognizing them. And uh, I think what you can pretty quickly see is none of the mutations, none of the variants that we've seen have mutants in any of the immunodominant um, T cell epitopes so far. That might change, but for the most part, um, T cells are still able to recognize these variants just fine. Uh, there is one uh, mutation, the, the 452 mutation, that occurs in a couple of the epitopes, but these are minor epitopes, and they only exist on their own. Most of the concerning variant strains have multiple mutations. So I think there's reason for optimism. Um, a couple of uh, ways to look at that. Even the most, um, even the variants that have the most mutations in them only have about a five to tenfold reduction in neutralizing antibody. The vaccines often induce over a tenfold increase in neutralizing antibodies. So there's still headroom uh, between the vaccine induced protection and the variant's ability to evade. Um, only serum from some individuals who were infected by these variants had lower neutralizing antibody. So it's not like if you have the mutant, you're gonna have no protection. Um, only some people have lower um, protection. We've heard about monoclonal antibody therapies, and it's possible that some of the mutants will be less protected by monoclonal antibodies. But keep in mind, when the natural immune system, let's say by way of natural infection or by uh, vaccination, responds to the antigens, they produce a polyclonal antibody response. And that is much more likely to be protective than a monoclonal response. And just to reemphasize, antibodies are just one arm of immune defense. It is very likely that T cell responses and interferon responses may even be the keys to how we defend ourselves against uh, COVID-19 disease. And uh, just to reiterate, the variance with the changes in the big three-dimensional aspects of what's called the receptor binding domain of the spike protein are not found uh, in the immunodominant uh, T cell epitopes. So T cells are able to see these variants and respond to them just as well as they do the naturally occurring original uh, strain of the virus. What's really interesting is most of the variants emerge in patients who've been infected uh, for uh, after a couple of weeks. And so Importantly, if we can vaccinate individuals um, and prevent this lengthy um, incubation, if you will, for variants to emerge, it's very likely that we'll prevent or substantially reduce the likelihood that more variants will emerge. So it's really another way that vaccines can really help us going forward. And lastly, um, you know, to quote Emerson, nature hates monopoly. In most biological systems, including viruses, when a virus becomes extreme in the way it has mutated, it might gain an advantage in one way, but they often always lose advantage in another way. So they become unfit. So there might be a virus that's very, very likely to um, strongly bind to a receptor, but it loses oftentimes some other aspect that would allow it to cause disease. So, you know, we have nature working on our side here as well, that uh, viruses are, are, you know, able to mutate, but too much mutation is bad for them as well. So just some things to think about. Uh, last but not least, I'll just remind us that, uh, you know, we're talking about vaccines here. No vaccine is perfect, but arguably, you know, vaccines are safe and effective and will save countless lives. Um, uh, the approved vaccines for COVID-19 disease, as you know, have gone through a lot of scrutiny. And uh, even though the, the, the development has been faster than other vaccines in the past, they have had to meet all of the safety requirements, probably and more so than any vaccines that have ever been made. They are very likely to be safe in, in many NMOSD patients. Um, we we want to talk with the neurologist uh, to make sure you know, you're using the best vaccine for you at the right time with all the right precautions. We know that the virus mutates, that's natural. And we also feel that uh, even the current vaccines are likely to protect against most, if not all of these variants and may even prevent the emergence of future variants. Um, 
you know, the, uh, I think the idea is get out in front of infection and you can cause, you know, a, 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 a stop to some of the problems that you might have uh, down the road if, you, if, if, if no uh, preventative measures were in place. Uh, vaccines are not one size fits all. We've talked about the different kinds of vaccines, some of the, you know, uh, precautions you need to consider. Really, please carefully discuss this with your doctor. Uh, we know that certain immunosuppressive therapies can impact the efficacy of certain vaccines, but I'll just reemphasize, even some protection is better than no protection. So I think we really want to uh, refocus on the concept that even if you're on an immunosuppressive therapy, there can be a good window for vaccination, uh, and we can talk about how to preempt possible symptoms or reactions uh, that the vaccine may cause. Um, so bottom line, COVID-19 vaccines um, and options for their use should be available for NMOSD patients, just like everybody else. Okay, let me stop there. I'll hand it back over to Lisa with one last point, And that is, you know, right now we're talking about um, where we are with the vaccines. We've got about 40% protection based on just people, you know, uh, using precautions like masking and distancing. Uh, about 10% protection based on natural infections. And right now we're at about 10% of the population having been protected by medical immunity or vaccines. What we really need to do is move this uh, vaccinated number out to a much larger number. That can break the chain of the pandemic and we can all kind of get back to normal. So let me stop there. Um, Lisa, I'll hand it back over to you. And thanks very much everybody for your uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Yaman. That was very, very informative. I know I learned a lot from you and always do. We have had a lot of questions come in from the patient community. Um, the biggest issue, apart from what you've already addressed, Dr. Yaman, is relapse. A lot of patients are worried about relapse and if they could potentially relapse from taking this vaccination. Can you address that? Sure, great question. So um, a couple of ways to look at this. First of all, you know, there are no strong data that suggests that vaccines cause relapses in NMOSD. There are some anecdotal um, uh, data, but if you look at it in terms of a systematic data analysis, um, you know, we can't say for sure that vaccines cause any problems in NMOSD. Now, that's fine. And even so, we still want to be as, you know, as optimally safe as we can. Um, some of the vaccines might induce a little bit of fever. Some of them, you know, can promote obviously an immune response. In NMOSD, um, I think the ideas are to, to get out in front of that, you know, based on discussions with your doctor. For example, um, you can use um, a pre-medication schema that involves, you know, Tylenol or some other um, drug to prevent fever. Um, if you're a person who tends to be more allergic than not, um, maybe, you know, using some kind of an antihistamine. But the point is that for the most part, you know, now having millions and millions of people vaccinated with these vaccines, many of whom have had, um, you know, various types of other comorbidities, there does not seem to be any issues that we know of with respect to these vaccines causing relapses in any, any autoimmune disease. Um, we want again, to be as, as safe as we can. So talk to your doctor. Maybe it's best for you to, to use something that will you know, help minimize the chance of a high fever and minimize the chance of any um, allergic response. But for the most part, at least I think uh, they're gonna be pretty safe. Thank you, Dr. Yaman. Um, there's a question that says, do the vaccines prevent you from getting and transmitting COVID-19? And if not, how does that provide herd immunity if it's still transmittable? So um, getting the, uh, the, the virus, I guess, is what the question is. So does a vaccination prevent a person from being exposed to the virus? Um, no, not that we know of, but it very likely will cause the immune system to rapidly clear the virus. And so it, we don't have the data yet. There, this is being studied but the vaccines are very likely to dramatically shorten the time 
that an individual um, carries the virus, even if they don't get the disease. Um, so this is called shedding. If they now pass a, a virus on to somebody else, uh, we don't know the data yet, but um, it's very likely that the vaccines will, you know, significantly reduce the chance for carriage or shedding of these viruses. That in turn should significantly reduce the chance that individuals can transmit from one to another. And in turn, that should you know, dramatically lessen the, the likelihood for ongoing pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Yaman. Um, our next question says, why should we get the COVID vaccine instead of waiting to see if we contract the virus? Are we not better off with antibodies we build naturally with the virus than we are with the vaccine? So in theory, it's a good question, but let me just offer that first of all, COVID-19 disease can be deadly. And so, you know, just waiting until you are naturally infected risks you dying from that infection. So that's point number one. Point number two is not everybody has a strong um, immune response to the natural infection. In fact, it looks like the more severe the disease, the better the immune response. As you know, 50% or more of the population that encounters the virus have very mild or no symptoms. So there's a little bit of a possible misperception that if you've already tested positive, for example, to the virus, but had no symptoms or just mild symptoms, that you're gonna be protected against future infection. And so far as the data suggests, that is not true. So um, even if you've been infected, uh, we recommend that you do be vaccinated. We recommend that um, uh, you wait a period of time after a natural COVID-19 um, disease uh, passes, um, 45 to 90 days before you're vaccinated. But um, a natural infection is unlikely to provide you the same kind of protection that the, uh, that the vaccines do, at least as far as we know. Thank you. Um, I know you addressed in your PowerPoint uh, immune suppressants and how much immunity could be developed and how timing works with that. We have a question about plasmapheresis. Will the vaccine be effective on monthly, on monthly plex? And if so, what is the best time to get it? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a, it's a complicated answer because Plasmapheresis is meant to remove antibody, among other things. Um, it does not remove cells, uh, but it, it will remove antibody. And so, you know, very likely antibody response to a COVID-19 vaccine would be significantly diminished by, by plasmapheresis. Um, the T cell response, you know, and B cell response, if, if if that is uh, a response in that individual, you know, will will re-emerge. That is, you'll you'll continue to have T cell, you know, memory, and B cells ultimately will, you know, make the antibody again that that hopefully is protective against COVID nineteen. But um, you know, plex plasmapheresis will lower your antibody levels against um, this virus, even if you're vaccinated. So that's something you'll have to talk with your doctor about. You know, there's a possibility of using a monoclonal or some other type of replacement antibody, possibly IVIG, but again, that may not be specific against COVID-19. So it's a little bit of a complicated situation. Thank you for that answer. Um, is there a blood test that can be taken after we get the vaccine to make sure the vaccine is effective? And if so, how long after vaccination should we get it? Yeah, I mean, if you really wanted to um, have an antibody test done before you're vaccinated, um, unless you've had COVID-19 exposure prior, you should be antibody negative, then get vaccinated and wait 14 days. And your antibody should become positive if the vaccine um, had its effect. That doesn't mean antibody is, you know, is the end all for protection, but it's a surrogate that your immune system has responded to the vaccine. What about people who have had adverse reactions to previous vaccines, especially anaphylaxis? 
So if you've had an anaphylactic response to anything from a bee sting to a vaccine, you'll wanna talk with your doctors, make sure that they are aware of this history. Um, doesn't mean you can't be vaccinated. It just means we have to take special precautions, including you know, um, being vaccinated in a, in a clinical setting where there's a lot of support measures should there be a, a, a hyperallergic response. But it also means that you'll probably want to talk with your doctor about pre-medicating, maybe using an antihistamine in advance of being vaccinated. So most importantly, if you have that kind of an allergic history, make sure that, you, uh, that your neurologist or whoever is providing you the vaccine is fully aware of that history and, and takes all the right precautions. If the goal of therapies is to keep patients at zero B cells, and most of us on a scheduled infusion are that way, then would it really matter when we get the infusion if our B cells are always at zero? So, um, you know, great question. I think uh, what, what we have to just keep in mind is a couple things. First, if you're using, you know, a B cell depletion drug, it means that the B cells in your bloodstream might be very low. They're not gonna be zero, but they'll be very low. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the vaccine won't reach B cells that are in other places in your body, maybe in your spleen or maybe in your bone marrow, for example. So there's the chance that the vaccine could um, activate those B cells, which would help you in, in your immune response. But even if your, your overall B cell count is very low, Again, it doesn't mean you can't be vaccinated. It just means you gotta pick the right time window for vaccination, either before you start B cell depletion or at a time window that you talk with your neurologist toward the end of a cycle of the dose. So maybe five or so months after your dose. Uh, and when your B cells are beginning to recover, uh, but you're not yet at the time for the next dose. So that's a, a possible vaccination window but please, again, talk to your NMOSD neurologist, find the best time to be vaccinated. And I'll just point out, Lisa, you know, we talked about COVID-19 vaccines here, but there are other vaccines too we should all be aware of. Uh, for example, you know, with some NMOSD medications, we have to vaccinate against meningococcal disease. For all of the immunosuppressive therapies, we always want to try to update our immunizations in advance. Um, that might include you know, hepatitis B vaccine or a vaccine for pneumonia or shingles or other types of infections, because the more we can do to protect ourselves through vaccines, the, the safer any immunosuppressive drug will be. Lisa, I think, I think you might still be muted. Let me just say a few more words about that while, while Lisa's um, coming back online. Uh, you know, we, we like to talk about, um, uh, you know, when and, and how to, to use vaccines in immunosuppressive therapy. I think, you know, the bigger picture is um, before you begin an immunosuppressive therapy, um, there have to be screens that are done to, to sort of assess your level of protection against certain um, types of infections, whether or not you have, you know, things like tuberculosis, et cetera. So those are perfectly normal screens. It also is a great opportunity to update your vaccine immunizations. And again, that's really, you know, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So Lisa, back over to you. We have a question from a patient that says, I started in spring in December after being on Rituxan for a number of years, and I'm also on Hyzentra sub-Q. Is it okay for me to get the vaccine since I just started a new treatment? So, um, you know, satralizumab, an IL-6 receptor inhibitor. I can tell you here are some of the, the, the historical data that, that should be reassuring to you. So uh, in studies using tocilizumab, which is a, a, a very close cousin to satralizumab, uh, in, in vaccine studies that, that looked at influenza vaccine and vaccines against bacterial organisms, 
tocilizumab had a very mild effect on, on vaccine responses. That is, it did not do much in the way of preventing a good vaccine response. So it's very likely the same is true for satralizumab. Vaccines have not been studied in individuals um, specifically using satralizumab, so we don't know for sure. But if we go based on drugs that are very similar to satralizumab, um, it's very likely you'll have a good response to the vaccines. In terms of when to use the vaccines, talk to your neurologist. Um, you know, you might find that uh, toward the end of a, of a monthly dosing cycle, just before you get your next dose, maybe that's a good time to do the, the vaccination. But um, there's a good time window uh, and there should be a pretty good response um, uh, to the vaccines, uh, even if you're on those kinds of drugs. Thank you, Dr. Yeaman. Um, this patient writes, I'm due for my next dose of reduction on, on 219. I'm 60 years old and have not been offered the vaccine as of yet. Do I need to delay my reduction until I can get the vaccine or stay on schedule and take the vaccine when it is offered to me? So if you're on rituximab, you know, it's a B cell depletion agent. Um, ideally, you'll be vaccinated when your B cells are, are near normal, um, if possible. So, uh, you know, if you're talking about um, February 19th and you have the opportunity to, to be vaccinated, let's say the first couple of weeks of February, if it were me, I would take that opportunity because that might be sort of a perfect window where your B cells are starting to recover possibly and uh, you, you haven't yet gotten your next dose. Ideally, you'll give your immune system, you know, seven to 14 days after you're vaccinated before your next B cell depletion um, dosing. But again, these are all things you'll have to talk carefully with uh, your neurologist, find the best window for vaccination. And uh, as I've said, you know, good protection is better than no protection. Thank you. We just have a couple of more questions. Um, one is, should we be wearing two masks as I have seen suggested in many places? So great question. Um, it, I, I guess I would say a couple of things. First, it depends on the kind of mask, right? If you're wearing an N95 mask, two, two of those won't help. Um, if you're wearing you know, a, a very, um, um, uh, not very poly uh, layered or, or um, uh, a mask that is made of a material that is not um, highly likely to, to block out a lot of things like you know, just a very basic cotton mask or something like that, it's possible that, that double layering masks will be helpful. If you're wearing a surgical mask kind of a mask, those are poly layered. Um, uh, they're not N95 masks, but um, you know, again, it, it really relates to the kind of mask you're talking about and the kind of risk you're putting yourself in um, just in day-to-day -day activities. Maybe you'd want to wear, you know, a double layer of a of a cloth mask, you know, if you're going to be at the grocery store or if you're going to, you know, be in a situation where there's a little bit more risk. Um, but, you know, in theory, yeah, double layering can help, but uh, so can being vaccinated. So I would really emphasize, uh, you know, doing everything you can to stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Yeaman. Um, as we wrap up, I wanted you to think about things you could say to help alleviate the fears that a lot of our patient population have. There's been a lot of questions that have come in about, is the vaccine actually safe for NMO patients to take? And I think you've addressed that. But is there something you can say or would like to say to our audience just to help alleviate the fears that a lot of our patients have about the vaccination? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. So, you know, um, I guess here's what I would say. If you look at the, the global population now that has been vaccinated, we're talking about you know, somewhere between 30 and 40 million people, maybe more. Um, you know, when vaccines are used in that many people and there is very rare reporting of any bad events, yes, we've heard about some you know, anaphylactic responses, most of those, if not all, have been in individuals who had a history of very strong allergic responses to other things. So that wasn't vaccine specific. Um, we, we know just purely based on the numbers, you know, when 
when you know 40, 50 million people are vaccinated and uh, we don't hear really any major safety signals, that should be very reassuring to, to everyone. But these vaccines, for the most part, are extremely safe. Um, and you can, as NMOSD patients, even do more uh, to, to enhance safety. For example, talk with your, your NMOSD neurologist if you're concerned about, let's say, a fever or a really strong immune response, you know, perhaps uh, um, pre-medicate to keep fever down and to suppress you know, allergic responses. But uh, I, I think it's just really now gaining more and more experience with these vaccines, Lisa, that tells us you know, that they really are safe in, in, in most people. Um, you know, there are special circumstances for some, some individuals, uh, but those largely can be addressed. Um, you know, one, one thing to think about is, again, the concept that um, COVID-19 um, infection, as we've all heard, can kill people. And, you know, a vaccine, even if it's not perfect protection, um, most of the vaccines that have reported data will prevent death due to COVID-19. Um, you know, some are better at preventing any disease, uh, than others, but you know, when you get up around you know, 70, 80, 90% protection of any disease caused by this virus and 100% protection against death, that is remarkable. And if you combine that with safety, then I think we're really talking about a good opportunity for NMOSD patients to protect themselves um, and those they love. You know, when we get vaccinated, it, we also become individuals who, are, who are, are less likely to spread an infection. And so, you know, I think in the big picture, um, there's a lot of reason for optimism. The vaccines look like they're very safe, effective. It looks like they will address the variants to a large degree and might even prevent uh, further variants from emerging. Um, but, you know, um, bottom line, uh, each person is an individual and we need to, to optimize how we use vaccines. They're not one size fits all, but there is going to be a good option for, for NMOSD patients to be vaccinated against this virus and against other organisms that can cause trouble, um, particularly um, in immunosuppression. Thank you so much, Dr. Yaman, for your time and effort this morning. Your presentation was very informative and very fascinating. And on behalf of the patient community, we appreciate everything you do to bring to the forefront all the issues of COVID and answer all the questions. We thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope that you have a good day and can join us on our next online break breakout session. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk with you soon.